Hello and welcome back to Football League World TV. I'm your host, Alfie Burns, and I'm back with another fan takeover show. This evening, it's all about Sheffield United. I've got Hal from the Chef United Way podcast joining me as well. So, Hal, how are you getting on? I'm good, Alfie. Thanks for having us on. No, not a problem. Not a problem. We're going to get straight into it. You know, we're going to talk about the defeat to Middlesbrough last night for the Blades. So... It was, a, it was a disappointing result for Sheffield United last night in the Championship, losing 2-0 at Middlesbrough. Goals from Duncan Watmore and Paddy McNair, two quite tidy finishes. I must say, with, uh, with the difference between the two sides, I'll come to you first, Hal. What was your reaction to the result? Well, obviously, it wasn't what we expected. It wasn't what we hoped for. It was a dreadful game. I don't think one for the neutral. I think that's something Sky have got to learn. Every time they show Sheffield United on TV, It's first of all, it's a defeat for the Blades. And it's usually a poor game as well. Uh, the goals, you're right, they were good goals. They were goals worthy of winning any game. From a defensive point of view, and you always hear this, disappointing to concede goals like that. Nothing Robin Olsen could have done in the net. But again, we look so soft at the back. Yeah, and I mean, incredible stat, really. Sort of looking at it while I was doing my notes for the, for the show. They've not won at Middlesbrough since 1997. That's quite a record, isn't it? Yeah, not one I'm particularly proud of. I was there back in uh, October 1997, Blades legends, Dane Whitehouse and Brian Dean getting the goals after Mikel Beck had given Borough the lead. And just quite bizarre to think that every time we've been there since, and I've been to many of them because I used to live in that part of the world, uh, nothing. I mean, we don't even draw with Borough away. We just lose. And then weirdly, we seem to always beat them at Bramall Lane. And we had a similar terrible record at Ayrson Park as well. So we always used to think our bogey side is Walsall. I'm going to replace them with Middlesbrough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a, I'm sure there's a few Sheffield United fans feeling the same at the minute. Mm. So, I mean, with that in mind, it wasn't really a surprise result then. But, you know, I'm going to ask you what went wrong. Anything in particular stand out to you? Oh, we got Neil Warnock. Uh, we did. We saw Borough do to us what Neil Warnock, Sheffield United, used to do to other teams. If that's, that's a very convoluted way of saying that sentence. But, yeah, we... We saw it. We've seen it. We've read the book and we know the end. Uh, it was a case of they were playing like the away side. They were soaking up all our pressure, but over 70% of possession and hitting us on the break. And I, I think Sheffield United are bad at that. We're bad at playing that way. When we had success in the Premier League and we finished ninth, we were the side that were soaking up the pressure and hitting teams on the break. And that's what we're good at. We're not good at absolutely having to dictate the tempo from minute one. And that was really disappointing to see that in a way, that seems to be how we're approaching a lot of games. And perhaps that's to be expected because Sheffield United will be favourites with the amount of money we've spent on this squad to go straight back up. Uh, it's not really looking like that at the moment. No, I'm gonna, I want to touch on an individual now in, in Billy Sharp. And obviously, he's in decent form. Started last night, as, as you would expect. So a few comments floating around on Twitter saying that they felt that, that Sol Bamba really had the better of the battle, battle with him. Would you agree with that? I think Sol Bamba was fantastic. I was doing a watch along for the game. I called him man of the match before he was actually officially given man of the match, Sol Bamba. He was excellent. Billy looks a little tired. Uh, he's been playing up front on his own, which isn't his favoured. He likes to play up front with another striker. A lot of balls are just floated into the box and he's not the tallest. He's one of the strongest, absolutely, uh, but he's not the tallest. And aerially, he's, he's pretty good, but he's not great. Actually, we saw that against Derby County when he... he he absolutely had a head like a 50 pence piece with a really simple cross, which he should have done a lot better with. I'd love to see Billy playing up top with a striker. I think he could be the best mentor for Rian Brewster. We know that Billy and McGoldrick works. We know that Billy and McBurney doesn't work. So it'd be nice to see him get a regular strike partner, whoever that is. At the moment, he's having to play with different players in behind him. I think that's very difficult for him. And he's also finding himself doing a lot of the leg work going out wide, which is not where you want Billy Sharp. Yeah, of course, we've seen him over, over, especially in Chris Wilder's time at the club, you know, really thriving in a front two. I mean, he's, he's still not done too bad this season, three goals and three assists. He's in, he is in decent form and, and at 35, it, it's quite remarkable really to see him so effective still in the championship. You know, you've touched on Brewster there and McBurney last night when things weren't quite going right for Sharp, you know, against, against Sol Bamba. Was it frustrating for you to sort of see McBurney and Brewster just sort of sitting on the bench and not even getting on? Yeah, there was a, a moment when we substituted Ender Stevens, a left-back, and replaced him with Reese Norrington-Davis, a left-back. I thought that was the opportunity to put 
Ben Osborne at left back. He can play there. He's not the best there, but we were already losing 2 0. Put him there at left back and put a striker on. That was the substitution that I think all Blades were crying out for. And if not a striker, then a midfielder, a creative midfielder. But I think most of us would have thrown either McBurney or Brewster on at that point and just gone for it. What did we have to lose? Absolutely nothing. But we stuck to that sort of rigid formation. And one of the worries we had with uh, Slavici Akanovic getting the job, we'd heard from Fulham and Watford fans that he was quite hesitant to adapt and to change formation in-game. Even if they were getting battered, he would just kind of stick with it. And we are witnessing that firsthand. Yeah, absolutely. And we're talking about, we're not talking about two young strikers here either. We're talking about strikers that have done it at this level before and, and have a combined, you know, transfer fee of around 40 to 45 million pounds. You know, they're not going to start justifying that, that pr- those price tags sitting on the bench all season, are they? No, absolutely. Uh, Rian Brewster, it's a small sample size, but he played 20 games for Swansea and scored 10 goals. And uh, Ollie McBurney, similar. Uh, he's had spells where he hasn't scored goals and he's had spells where he has scored goals you know, he did very well on loan at Barnsley he did very well as a permanent signing for Swansea in the season before we signed him but prior to that he hadn't been a recognized goal scorer so we need to get him played to his strengths we've never played to Ollie McBurney's strengths it's not like he's missing chances when he gets games when he has a chance he does well with them uh, we just don't create anything for him and I do feel very sorry for Rian Brewster who's had I would imagine a career with Liverpool in the youth setup where he was a fox in the box and just having things on a plate for him. And I think he's a clinical finisher, but he is a fox in the box. And we've been playing him out wide or in a deeper role. That is not playing to Rian Brewster's strengths. Any Sheffield United fans with us want to get in touch and let us know their, their thoughts on Bernie and Brewster. Do get in the comments and, and we'll get you live on the show. Next up, we're going to talk about a few of the more recent additions of Ramon. So there was some good late some of business done at Bramall Lane from a, from a neutral's point of view. There were some good players arrived, you know, a couple of those, uh, Robin Olsen and, and Ben Davis arriving. You know, you've, you've spoken, Hal, about the sort of soft defence and the soft concessions last night. Are you confident that, you know, between that pair and what's already there, that they can provide some answers over the course of the season? Maybe. I've, I've not been overly convinced with Robin Olsen, despite his pedigree suggesting he should be the best goalkeeper we've ever had. Uh, Wes Fodderingham's actually looked much better in the short time that he came in. A worldy save against Southampton in the game I was at uh, in the League Cup. Uh, Olsen's, for me, positioning is something I'm, I'm really concerned about. I'm not a goalkeeper. I'm certainly not a goalkeeping expert. And I think he'll come good. I think he'll end up being a fabulous keeper. But at the moment, his positioning has left a lot to be desired. He's also parried shots I thought he should have saved in some of the games. Derby was one example and uh, made a few errors against Preston North End as well. So uh, I need to see more of him, definitely. And I want to see a huge improvement. Ben Davis looks good. Uh, looks like a decent centre back. We've changed formation. We used to play five at the back, really a three with two wing backs. But now we're playing four at the back. And it's going to take time to get used to that because we've been playing the same formation under Chris Wilder for sort of six years. And now suddenly it's all changed. And we look very, very shaky under this new formation. There's good players in the youth setup, which I'd have also liked to have seen given a chance, like Gordon and Lapata. But the real area of frustration is we don't have any wingers. And Yukanovic wants to play with wingers. Well, the problem is he left it too late. You know, he said that he was kind of happy with the formation when he joined of the 3-5-2. Then he decided he wanted to change it because that wasn't working. And uh, that was just sort of days before the transfer deadline. And we tried to get three wingers in and they all fell through. So here we are, sans wingers, uh, trying to play with players who aren't wingers as wingers. Yeah, and, and you touched on it there that they didn't land any wingers. But but a player that they did land late in the win- window was Conor Hurahan, who was added to a, a depth of you know, Richie's in the centre of the park. You know, he's he's chipped in with a couple of assists from set pieces already. Is he somebody that you see as a long-term starter this season? Set pieces were good against Hull City. The rest of the performances from him, he's looked a little bit rusty. He is very similar to Oliver Norwood, which we already have. I think he's a good player. I question if he was the area we most desperately needed, because as I mentioned, we have such good young players. I do feel like the pathway for some of our better youngsters is being blocked. Uh, I would love to have seen Zach Brunt get first team minutes. I don't think he's going to now. I'd love to have seen Regan Slater being given a chance. I don't think he's going to now either because we bought in Adelaine Gediora and uh, Conor Harahan. And we'll have to see how he gets on. So far, both of them have looked good. I'm not questioning the the signings. I'm just saying it's it's a shame that our, our homegrown youngsters who are blades and who would absolutely bleed red and white are going to have such a difficult opportunity now to get into the first team and that maybe has a knock-on effect for other youngsters who don't see a pathway when 
signings are just brought in on transfer deadline day in positions that we actually already have within the club. Yeah, and you know, you're talking about the youngsters that are, that are currently on the books in uh, Bramall Lane, and, and I'm going to talk about a different youngster that's come into the club on loan, and in Morgan Gibbs White, who's, who's arrived from Wolves. He's um, he's looked good since he's signed, and looks a really sort of smart addition. He's added a little bit of variety to the attack at, at Bramall Lane. Two goals and two assists in five games. Some talent, would you agree? Well, I, I want to keep quiet about him because I don't want Wolves to take him back. <laughs> yeah, he's excellent. The thing is, I'm worried about, he has a recall option in January. And if uh, Wolves aren't winning every single game, which they won't be, uh, they may well want to recall one of their brightest talents. He's looked outstanding in the games that he's played. Uh, maybe a little bit of a dip in the past couple of games, but I think that's only to be expected because he started so, so well. He's class. We all have already taken him to our hearts, and that's very dangerous. Never fall in love with a lone player. Yeah, and, and you talk about it there, the, the lack of wingers at the clubs. Gib, uh, the club, sorry, Gibbs White has played out wide at times and, and produced you know, a number of good crosses into the box. The, the goal that he set up at, at Hull City, for example, was an excellent ball into the penalty area. Is that, is that a position that you think he, he's going to have to thrive in over the season, or would you like to see him play more centrally? I think he'd like to see himself play more centrally against Borough. He got so frustrated out on that right because nothing was happening down the right. He actually came into the middle and said, right, I'll just do this myself. Uh, he wants to play centrally. There's absolutely no question about it. He is your archetypal AMC, your number 10. He's an attacking midfielder. That's where he wants to be. He's not a winger. He's having to play there because we don't have wingers. And he's doing very, very well. He's looking better than many wingers I've seen at Bramall Lane in the past who are out and out wingers. Yeah, he's just got so much ability. I think he could play almost anywhere yeah and, and obviously you've, you've spoken about the recall clause that, that wolves seem to have in the deal that's, that's brought into sheffield you know and, and the worry that that is let's put ourselves in that in that situation it comes january and, and sheffield united are, are where they are in the table at the minute still with an outside chance of sort of pushing on into the top six and and competing for a place back in the premier league and you lose gibbs white you know what what would you like to see the club do in that in that scenario you know to react to that uh, go after some of the players we failed to get in the previous transfer window, I think would probably be the best idea. Yeah. Uh, some of the players that we, or different wingers, basically just wingers would need to be brought in. Uh, if we're going to play that system, and I'm not convinced we should, but if Jukanovic is, then absolutely. If we're going to lose Morgan Gibbs-White, we already need to be looking for his replacement. So that's that's your priority then, looking ahead to January. Obviously, it's a long way away, but wingers. Yeah, and we don't even have wingers in the youth scene because uh, the whole the whole setup of the club was based around Chris Wilder and the three five two. So the under twenty threes play the three five two, the under eighteen play the three five two, the under fifteens, the under twelves. It's it's all geared up for that system, which is really actually a huge disaster. Bringing in then a manager who doesn't want to play that style. Uh, there's several questions over whether Ikanovic was actually the right man to bring in because of that. You know, there were other options. We already had Paul Heckenbottom at the club who actually did a very good job in a short time. I know you, you're familiar with his work and uh, perhaps not a huge fan, but he did he did very well at, at beautiful downtown Bramall Lane with the senior side. And I'd like to have seen him perhaps maybe given another opportunity to go again. Uh, Jukanovic is going to insist on a director of football, I'm sure, at some stage. That's just me guessing, but he's always worked under a director of football and Sheffield United don't have one. And I think that might be something that he will want implemented at Bramall Lane. And we've had a couple of comments in. I'll pop the first one up now. This is from Harry. How good do you think Iliman Endai can be? How good can he be, Hal? Yeah, he's already very good. There's some videos of him on uh, YouTube that his dad put up uh, from when he was about six all the way up to sort of 15. And you can see that he's been training all his life to be a professional footballer. The skills he had as a young boy are incredible. And he only gets better as the videos go on. And I've been showing my six-year-old nephew these, and we've been trying some of the drills in the garden. Uh, he's hopefully Theo, my nephew, is going to be the next Illiman and die. Uh, he looks like he's got everything you would need to be an attacking player. One thing he needs to work on is every time he loses the ball, he makes it his mission, like he is literally going to die if he doesn't win the ball back. He will run the full length of the pitch to win the ball back if he loses it. Obviously, as a fan, you love to see that, but it's not realistic for 90 minutes, which is why he's perhaps faded and been substituted every game because he gets cramp. He's just doing everything. He doesn't lose the ball often, but if you watch, every time he does, He'll try and win it back. That's a good trait in a player now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't I don't dislike <laughs> it, but he's gonna get too tired. Yeah. We've had another one here from Tom T. I really wish Oliver Burke could have cut it at Blades. What do you think went wrong for him? 
I consider myself the Burke whisperer. Uh, give me a week with Oli Burke and I will turn him into the player that he is because uh, there is a real player in there. He has looked at times when we see just brief glimpses like uh, Il Phenomena Ronaldo. He actually looks like he's got that ability to turn and run with the ball. What he needs to work on is his decision making. I think he's possibly the player I've seen who is the worst decision maker in professional football. He never chooses the right option with the final ball ever. Uh, even the goal he scored against Manchester United at Old Trafford was a terrible shot which rebounded to him and then another terrible shot that somehow crept in. His finishing is woeful. And yet we have seen glimpses. We see, keep seeing clips online from the club that put training shots in and his finishing in training is exemplary. We saw one example of it at Bristol Rovers in the cup away where it was just an incredible finish. And then we see him like he did against Southampton. He bursts into the box, beats three men and hits a shot that's so terrible it's going out for a throw but doesn't even have enough on it to get out for a throw. So he needs to work on his final decision. But I actually do think, and I, I know I'm on, a, I'm on an island here when it comes to Sheffield United fans, most of them think, no, he's just not going to work, get rid. I think there is something there worth working with. Yeah, and, and of course, I think that he's got traits that, that, that mean he, he could definitely play out wide, which, you know, you've been talking earlier on that, that there's this desperate need for wingers. He, you know, he, he could have been the answer, couldn't he? On one wing, I would love to see him play regularly on the right-hand side. It would, of course, mean we still need someone on the left. Uh, ben Osborne has kind of been filling in as a left winger. I think it's quite amusing to see Ben Osborne not only play as a left winger, but play very well as a left winger because he's been playing so much deeper, uh, either as a defensive midfielder or as a left back, as I mentioned earlier. But he's actually doing really well in that attacking wide left role. So maybe we already have the answer there. But then again, you, you can't really drop Morgan Gibbs-White for an out-of-form Ollie Burke. I just think long-term, we've got to stick with him. The guy cost £15 million at one point. Yeah, that that call that you've made there to to put Burke in instead of Gibbs White that that's a you know source for an absolute Twitter meltdown at two pm on Saturday, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, maybe uh, if and I was fatigued, Morgan Gibbs White in the middle, Ollie Burke on the right, it could work. <laughs> Let's see. Right, we're gonna we're gonna look ahead to the weekend and and what looks like a difficult trip to Bournemouth. So on the back of a disappointing result at Middlesbrough, uh, Sheffield United's focus drift into Saturday and a, and a clash with Bournemouth. It's, it's been a, a fairly decent month and, and the reaction from Sheffield United since the September international break has been good despite the blip at Middlesbrough. But this is a really a really tough game against one of the division's you know better performing sides in the opening two months of the season. You know, Hal, would you would you agree with that that it's, it's going to be tough for Sheffield United at the weekend? Yeah, Bournemouth haven't lost a game yet. and They don't concede goals either. Uh, they look like the real deal. I didn't think they necessarily would start as well. I did think they'd be in the mix because they've got a good squad. Let's see how good Scott Parker ends up being uh, as a gaffer because I think there's a lot of question marks still over him. I like him. I've always liked him. I liked him since he was in that McDonald's advert as a kid. But uh, I don't know if he's necessarily the man to take them to Premier League survival if they do get up. And I think they probably will at the start they've had. It's going to be really tough. It would be typical Blades to go and lose at Neil Warnock's Middlesbrough when they're on the, the cusp of sacking him uh, and then go and win at the only team you know in the top two that has really looked convincing every single game. So uh, let's see. Let's see if we can cause a, a shock and an upset and have a wonderful day at the seaside. Of course, you mentioned that Bournemouth are unbeaten at this moment in time. They play Peterborough this evening and we'll, uh, we'll see how they get on there. But, you know, it's, it's, it's understandably, it's a very, it's a very, very tough game. How, how do you think that the Blades can get back to winning ways then, Hal? I almost think we're in a false position in many ways. You know, you said we sort of looked good um, and bounced back from a bad start. I think it's a bit of a false one because we played a Derby County side who are in absolute turmoil and only beat 10-man Derby with a last-minute penalty. We couldn't beat Preston North End at home. We absolutely thrashed Peterborough, but I think they will be a team that will be will be down there. And we haven't really been convincing. I also think Hull will be a team that will probably get relegated as well, even though we, we beat them. So I'd like to see how we can actually perform for 90 minutes. Now we seem to have a settled formation against a good team. And I thought last night was the first barometer, the first real test since we settled on this formation. And we were left seriously wanting. If we play like that against Bournemouth, uh, we could get, to quote Stevie Nicholl, annihilated. 
So um, yeah, I'm a bit I'm a bit concerned. What we what I would personally do if I was in charge is I would I would absolutely throw this formation out into the bin. I don't, I don't like it. I don't think it works. But I hope that these are words that I am looking back on as uh, eating humble pie and saying as we get to 100 points at the end of the season with this formation that it just took time. And actually, it's the right way to go. And you know what? I'd almost be more impressed with Yukanovic if he stuck to his convictions and just said, this is my formation. This is what we're going with. Who cares if we don't have the players to actually fit it? We're going to make it work. Yeah, and you've, you've sort of led nicely into my next question there. You've spoken about the, the system. You, you want it to change. Whether you're convinced that it will or not you know, is, is another matter. Any key changes in personnel you'd like to see for the weekend? Uh, the man that no one can pronounce the name of, uh, I call him San Zander Berge, uh, but Sanderberger is what everyone else calls him. Uh, the reason I call him that is because that's how his name's actually pronounced. Uh, but that's not important. If he's fit, you probably got to bring him back, even though realistically there's only been sort of five games where he's actually looked like the world-class player that I think we know he all he is. Uh, but then again, who, who do you drop? I mean, I don't want to drop Illaman and Dai. He was one of the players that actually made things happen against Borough, hit the post. Obviously, you can't drop Morgan Gibbs-White. Ben Osborne's been our player of the season, arguably. Uh, then it's a case of, well, you can't leave Howrahan, Norwood and Fleck all out because you need that defensive sort of stability. So it's very, very difficult. This is why I would change formation, <laughs> it's just to, to accommodate uh, what, when we're fully fit, our uh, more attack-minded players. Maybe you drop... Sander back, but I personally think, and I know I'm, I'm in agreement with uh, our uh, Radio Sheffield analyst, Carla Saba here, he believes, and I, I agree with him, that uh, Sander is best as a number 10, just behind either a front two or, or a, a single striker, for me a front two, but the way we're playing at the moment, that's where I think you get the best out of him. However, we might have to play him as a defensive midfielder, because uh, that might be the only way we can get in in the side. Yeah, that that was something that I was I was going to ask you with regard to Berg. I won't go for the the pronunciation like you did, and, and his best position. So you think it's as a number ten? Obviously, I think the game that I was at quite recently was the Preston game, and he, and he came on on the wing. What, what mm -hmm. are your thoughts on him out there? It just seems like everybody's getting shoehorned out wide at the minute, doesn't it? Well, it's exactly that, Alfie. Everyone is. I think uh, we're doing live trials uh, with <laughs> with Jukanovic. He's just trialing everyone out on the right wing and seeing who can actually cut it. At the moment, Morgan Gibbs White has uh, has worn and he's through to the next round. But we'll see. We'll see if Sander actually is the answer there longer term. If he is, I'd be very surprised because it's not a position he's played uh, throughout his entire career. If you look back at it, uh, but. Maybe. Uh, he's got all the attributes. He's another player that I believe could play almost anywhere. I think he's got enough in his locker to be uh, a defensive midfielder, a very good one. I think he's got enough to be, as I mentioned, that, that attacking midfielder. And you saw her against Preston. He actually changed the game uh, when he came on on the right-hand side. He was probably as surprised as you were to see him there. Yeah, absolutely. So, come on then. Let's get a, a score prediction for Saturday. It obviously feels a long way away, given that we're only on Wednesday evening, but... But given I probably won't get to speak to you between now and then, I'd, I'd like to know your prediction for the game. Oh, I hate doing these. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm really notoriously on our channel bad at predictions. So whatever I say, you want to go the other way. Uh, you know, on form, if I wasn't a blade, I would say 4-0 uh, Bournemouth. Uh, because I am a blade and my heart often rules my head, I reckon we could soak up an absolute mountain of pressure, finally see that display at the back from Davis and Egan with Olsen pulling off save after save, absolutely perform atrociously and nick a 1-0 with uh, Billy Sharp scoring famously as he already did against Bournemouth when we were back in the Prem uh, very late on. I would take that. Hashtag scenes. Yeah, that was that was the first thing that, that came to mind when I saw that this fixture was coming up this weekend, the, uh, the chaos in the away end after Sharp had equalised in that game. Special, yeah, yeah. special memories. Yeah, we were a much better side then. <laughs> a much better side who knew how to play for each other and had just carried on from League One all the way up with the same players, bar one or two. And uh, that was a side that I loved and a side you could be proud of. It seems to be sort of just a collection of bodies at the moment and who can play where. But hey, I'm just getting depressed now thinking about the current state of things and I miss Chris Wilder. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good place to end this segment, Matt. <laughs> Right, so that concludes the Sheffield United Takeover show. Thanks for joining me, Hal. I hope you've enjoyed your Wednesday evening with me. 
I hate Wednesdays, full stop, obviously. Um, this is a day after an awful defeat, and I've now just reminded myself uh, about Chris Wilder. So, yeah, I'm in great mood. Cheers. Yeah, enjoy, enjoy the rest of your evening then. So, <laughs> Thanks. That's it for Football League World TV for today. Uh, we've got a couple of shows coming up tomorrow. I think we're, we're finishing off our review of the midweek fixtures and, and George Douglas is, is back with the London show as well. So two shows and I think George Douglas is at, is at the wheel for both of those. So, so do make sure you tune in and in between now and then, take care. 